Good afternoon and welcome to our noontime webinar. I'm Dr. Jill Brooks, Director of Education for First Healthcare Compliance. Our cloud-based compliance program management solution ensures compliance in all regulatory areas, all in one place. As part of our educational webinar series, we try to provide up-to-date information for those in the healthcare industry. As part of our registration for the webinar, we asked you about future webinar topics that you may have interest in. Our previous registrants have expressed interest in a webinar providing education related to harassment in the workplace. We are so pleased to have Scott Holt, partner of Young, Conaway, Stargat, and Taylor, presenting today's webinar, Preventing Workplace Harassment. Scott represents public and private employers in all phases of labor and employment law, including collective bargaining, employment counseling and litigation, class actions, non-competition litigation, and executive compensation. Scott is recognized in his area of practice by Chambers USA, America's Leading Lawyers for Business, and Best Lawyers in America for Labor and Employment, and Delaware Super Lawyers for Labor and Employment and Employment Litigation Defense. Scott? Hey, thank you, Jill, for the introduction, and uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are, uh, to everyone on the call. As Jill mentioned, uh, my name is Scott Holt, and uh, I'm an attorney with Young, Connolly, Sargett, and Taylor, and I've been practicing employment law for about uh, 20 years now, and today we're going to talk about uh, something that's become a more of a common occurrence for employers, and that is what, ha what happens when the employee comes to you and says they are being harassed. And if you look at uh, statistics from the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is the federal agency responsible for um, uh, shepherdizing the laws on harassment, uh, there are stats out there that says about 9% of uh, the female workforce has at one point said they were a victim of sexual harassment. And there are similar uh, statistics from the EEOC that there's an uptick, a general uptick in the amount of harassment claims being filed with that agency. And, and the term harassment has legal significance. Um, it may trigger certain legal um, obligations on the part of an employer. Uh, it also may trigger certain liabilities if it's not rectified. And when you're looking at uh, issues of, of harassment, generally those are dictated as what constitutes uh, harassment uh, by federal as well as state laws that, uh, that uh, 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 apply to discrimination statutes. And federal laws obviously apply to everyone who has employees in the United States. If they're over a certain fresh threshold of number of employees, usually that's 15 employees. Um, if you uh, are in the state, there's a good chance you also have a uh, state law that may have, have separate and independent obligations regarding uh, what you need to do about harassment in the workplace. And that could include training for your employees and it may apply to employers with even lower thresholds than the 15 employees I talked about uh, before. So uh, when we're uh, talking about uh, harassment in the workplace, I mean, generally I want to talk about some of the, the myths out there about what constitutes harassment when it occurs. I mean, for instance, you have an employee who comes to you and says she feels she's being harassed uh, and she's told she should confront the harasser. Another situation might be, all types of workplace harassment are unlawful. And we're going to talk today about that. That's not always the case. Uh, as I said, the term harassment has legal significance, and it's how that term is defined that dictates your legal obligations in the workforce. Another myth, uh, unlawful harassment can, uh, uh, can occur outside the workplace. Well, actually, that's not a myth. That's actually true. Uh, you can have certain circumstances where uh, harassment off that the employer's premises can uh, actually rise to the level of, of harassment. Uh, and finally, unlawful harassment requires intent to harass. Well, that is a myth. Um, it's not like a criminal statute that is required to show that the person intended to do what uh, had been done. It actually, you would be looking at uh, the alleged victim and whether the uh, harassment was considered unwelcome. So we'll talk about that today as well. So three points to begin with um, to keep in mind here. It's impact, not intent. The, the impact of the conduct, not necessarily the intent of the harasser that's controlling. Uh, to no one likes to be picked on the workplace um, and, and what constitutes harassment may or may not trigger legal obligations on your part. 
Uh, and finally, a thing to consider is think before you speak, uh, and that kind of goes to training and employees with harassment. And we're going to kind of talk about all three things today. And generally, uh, the agenda that I put together uh, is in three different parts. Uh, first off, uh, we're going to talk about uh, what is um, discrimination or harassment and, and how do you prevent it, uh, what steps you uh, need to take in order to prevent uh, those types of, uh, uh, of conduct. Second, we're going to look at uh, correction. You may be required by law uh, to correct any uh, uh, harassment that's occurring in, in the workplace. Uh, we'll talk about those obligations under federal law. Uh, as well as some common traps, uh, some issues that may arise when employees bring complaints as well as when supervisors uh, are handling these types of complaints. And, and finally, um, we'll talk a bit about uh, the chronic complainer, and that is the employee that basically feels that everything that happens in the workplace is uh, some type of harassment. And uh, it's a very tricky issue because it comes up quite a bit more often than you would think, and you have to be very... Um, careful how you handle those types of, of complaints. So let's first talk about this prevention issue uh, and, and what you need to do to prevent um, harassment at the workplace. And, and generally, uh, before we do that, we need to understand what these terms mean, starting with discrimination. Um, as I said before, discrimination um, is usually based on a federal or state law that prohibits uh, uh, you know, discriminating against individuals based on a certain protected trait or characteristic. Uh, and actually, harassment is a subset of discrimination. When you look at what constitutes harassment, uh, it is only part of what could constitute unlawful uh, discrimination. And, and this is important uh, for both understanding discrimination as well as harassment because there's a certain liability if this occurs in your workplace. Um, under federal statutes, for instance, if you are found to have engaged in, as an employer, discrimination and or harassment, then uh, the uh, employee that was the victim of that discrimination or harassment uh, may be entitled to compensatory damages, lost wages, punitive damages, as well as recovery of their attorney's fees if they bring suit. So uh, that's some of the reasons you need to kind of understand these laws and have uh, certain measures in place to prevent them in the workplace. Now, when we're looking at what constitutes discrimination, there's generally two things that have to be, um, uh, to have to exist in order for discrimination to occur. Uh, and we'll talk about each. The first is uh, it has to be some type of adverse employment action uh, taken against the employee. And that adverse action has to be taken because of that employee's protected characteristic. Those are the two necessary elements that have to be present in order to have unlawful discrimination. And looking at the first element, adverse uh, employment action, what is that? Well, I mean, there's some obvious ones and there's some not so obvious ones that could uh, constitute an adverse employment action. For the obvious ones, uh, you look at ones uh, that are pretty basic, uh, firing someone because of a uh, protected uh, characteristic, uh, failing to hire that person, demoting that person, not giving them a promotion, uh, denying them bonuses or raises, those are the more obvious types of adverse employment actions um, that would make up that first part of the element. But there's less obvious ones that uh, can arise too, and it's important to understand those as well. For instance, uh, how about if you didn't give uh, the best assignments to a certain employee and that was because of protected characteristic? That could be considered to be an adverse employment action. Uh, smaller office. Uh, we've seen cases where people have complained that they were given smaller office because of a protected characteristic or even a, a, a secretary that was not as capable. Um, another one in a recent case I've just had is the employee uh, is alleging that she and others of her similar race were not invited to happy hours by coworkers and that uh, during his happy hours that was often talked about important business and she's claiming that was a form of adverse employment action. And generally the way the courts would look at it, uh, if, if the employee can show that this type of conduct adversely affected 
any other terms and conditions of employment that could constitute an adverse uh, action. And that's the key really is, is what the employer is doing um, adversely affecting the terms and conditions of that employee's employment. Now the second uh, part of what constitutes discrimination is the protected characteristic of the individual uh, claiming discrimination. And again, this is defined by statute, uh, sometimes federal and sometimes state uh, statutes. Um, and if you look at the various categories, you can have um, uh, discrimination based on race, religion, sex, including pregnancy, uh, disability, uh, age, and in many states, sexual orientation uh, is also uh, a protected characteristic. Uh, and most of the federal laws uh, do apply to these protected characteristics, with the exception of sexual orientation. So far, uh, the federal um, laws, including Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, has not been amended to uh, apply to sexual orientation. But there's been a recent development on that front uh, that I should tell you about. Just last week, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, uh, made a determination that um, employers um, who discriminate against uh, employees because of their sexual orientation are violating Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Um, that's a very recent development uh, passed uh, case law issued by courts has found that it does not cover sexual orientation, but the EOC is taking a very aggressive stance on this, and we're likely to see some decisions on whether their ruling will be upheld. Now, uh, next, let's talk about what constitutes harassment. Um, and as I said before, uh, this is a subset of uh, unlawful discrimination. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, even though some of these discrimination statutes were in place as early as the 1960s, harassment really didn't become actionable in the United States as a, as a cause of action until the 1990s. Uh, it wasn't until the um, amendments uh, to certain laws in 1990 were made, uh, as well as certain remedies under the law, that harassment cases um, were actually even recognized by the courts. And uh, since that time, as I indicated uh, at the beginning, uh, there has been an uptick in the number of harassment claims filed, uh, both with the EEOC as well as in, in, and with courts. But if you look at uh, harassment, you can break it down into two different types of harassment that are legally recognized as being unlawful. The first type is uh, what's known as quid pro quo, that is, Latin for uh, this for that. That's the classic case where um, you have a supervisor uh, who has actual authority to either promote, hire, or fire, or deny compensation to employees, who basically says in order for an employee to, to get uh, some type of preferential treatment or not get adverse treatment, they have to do something for them. And usually uh, this is going to be regards to a sexual uh, 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 sexual nature, meaning, um, if, you know, the classic case of the supervisor uh, uh, implying or um, uh, outright requesting an employee to, uh, to have sex relations with them in order to get a promotion or to move ahead in the company. Um, the one thing that's less obvious in these types of cases uh, is happens when if, if the employee who actually has been given a promotion uh, because they have agreed to some type of sexual favor for that uh, supervisor, is, is there a claim uh, uh, or a cause of action by other employees? And the answer is often case there is. You can actually have employees, uh, and I'll use the circumstance where you have uh, one uh, female worker who's having uh, a relationship with uh, her supervisor and gets a promotion, other employees, uh, female employees at that same type of position may think that in order to get ahead and get a promotion with a the company, they have to have a relationship with that supervisor. And so that's why a lot of employers, rightfully so, just decide to have policies which prohibit supervisors having any type of sexual relationship with employees under their direct supervision to prevent these types of quid pro quo claims from arising.
Now, the other type of uh, harassment is known as the hostile work environment claim, and this is a little more complicated to prove, uh, but there are far more claims, I think, based on hostile, hostile work environment than the, the classic quid pro quo. Uh, and it's broader. It can apply not just to sexual harassment claims, uh, like in the case of quid pro quo. It can apply to claims based on race, on uh, disability, on sex, any of the protected uh, characteristics that we had talked about before. And in order to bring a claim for hostile work environment, there's generally three requirements uh, to, uh, that are needed to be present. The first requirement is the, has to be the hostile work environment itself, and we'll talk about that el those elements of that type of environment. Second, the employer has to have knowledge, uh, either actual or imputed knowledge, that this uh, type of activity is going on. And third, the employer has to fail to correct that type of situation. So we'll talk about those three uh, elements now. So what constitutes a hostile work environment? Well, there's generally three requirements to uh, meet a hostile work environment. First, it has to be unwelcome. Um, and, and we'll talk about that. Uh, what uh, unwelcome means, is it based on the victim's viewpoint or is it based on the harasser's uh, viewpoint? And second, it has to be because of a protected uh, category, as I mentioned before, race, sex, age, disability, any of the ones that are protected by other state or federal law. And finally, it has to be bad enough. And what do I mean by bad enough? Well, we'll talk about that, but basically it's it's got to be conduct that rises to a level where it crosses a certain line. And that line is always not always clear, but the courts have developed tests for it to help employers determine when something goes too far to constitute um, a hostile work environment. So let's talk about um, uh, the unwelcomeness uh, factor of a hostile work environment. Uh, and I mentioned before, Whose perspective is it, is it based on? Is it based on the uh, alleged victim or the alleged harasser? Because often you have a case of, uh, of a alleged harasser being accused of harassment, and the first thing is, I had no idea. I never thought this was something they uh, had expressed to me as being offensive. But uh, under the law, it's not based on the harasser's intent, the alleged harasser's intent. It's based on the victim's viewpoint. Um, so um, you get certain circ circumstances where uh, the uh, alleged harassers say the victim never told me uh, that they were being offended. Uh, and it's not always necessary for the victim to have to tell the, um, the alleged harasser to stop. I mean, it's certainly encouraged, and you should have it in a policy as a starting point. But for instance, if the alleged harasser is a victim's direct supervisor uh, or someone in a very powerful position in the company, it might not be as easy for the person to tell them, I don't like what you're doing, and this is not acceptable. So you always have to kind of look at the context of the situation to determine whether something is unwelcome. But the bottom line is, it's based on the victim's viewpoint, not the alleged harasser. Now the second category, as I mentioned before, it has to be based um, on a protected uh, category, meaning the harassment has to be based on one of those protected categories under federal or state law. And you also have uh, employees coming in and using the harassment term for a lot of different things. But if it's not based on one of these um, protected categories uh, under federal or state law, if it's just they're harassing me because they don't like me, uh, and it's not based on one of these protected categories, that doesn't constitute unlawful harassment. It um, doesn't necessarily mean, as an employer, you shouldn't take steps to remedy that um, situation, but uh, your duties uh, are certainly or may not be triggered if the harassment is just based on the fact that uh, the, the person doesn't like him for whatever reason, as long as it's not for one of these protected categories. Now, the last element of, of what, how you uh, show um, a hostile work environment, it's probably the most difficult uh, to kind of determine, and that is what is bad or, or so bad as far as behavior or conduct 
that it's going to kind of cross that line, as I as I mentioned before, and go into the uh, the area of, of constituting unlawful uh, sec or unlawful harassment. And, and really, when you look at the behavior, you have generally three types of categories. It could be physical type of behavior. It could be touching, um, groping, uh, unwelcome uh, physical contact. Uh, contact. It can be verbal uh, uh, behavior. It can be jokes, remarks made to the person, individual about their protected uh, trait. It can be visual as well. I mean, you can have uh, jokes or cartoons, uh, emails going back and forth, uh, being shared with a person or that the person sees that contain offensive material based on uh, that protected uh, characteristic. Uh, but the standard, uh, as a course of defiance, it's got to be either severe or pervasive, and that's kind of where that bad enough conduct is, meaning when I say severe, uh, it has to be uh, very bad usually, um, and, and the usual question is how bad does that have to be? Well, there's been instances where one incident of, of groping or contact or some extremely bad behavior could be severe enough to constitute uh, unlawful harassment. Uh, pervasive usually means it's been going on for some time um, and it could be based on something more slight and subtle, but because it's been going on for such, uh, such a long period of time, it can rise a level that it does constitute uh, some type of actionable harassment. So when you're talking about bad enough, it's got to be either severe or pervasive and you have to look at the type of behavior. And the one thing that kind of helps uh, employers understand where that line is drawn, uh, and it's important, um, is this reasonable standard that the courts have established for determining whether conduct has kind of crossed that line. And uh, as I mentioned before, when you're determining whether any type of harassment is uh, unwelcome, you look at the uh, viewpoint of the alleged victim. You, it's their perception of whether it's unwelcome. But uh, the courts have also in, uh, interjected a reasonableness component into that question, meaning it not only has to be unwelcome in the eyes of the alleged victim, but also it has to be uh, such behavior that a reasonable person in the victim's shoes, meaning uh, of their same sex or race or age, uh, would find that conduct offensive or abusive. So it, uh, it, it's basically there to address what we often call the eggshell plaintiff. That is that person that would be offended by everything in the workplace, everything that goes on. Um, because if you just had the one standard uh, where it's based on the employee's, employee's own perception of whether it's unwelcome, you'd have a lot more claims. This reasonable factor and requirement allows uh, the court and the employer to say, if I were in your shoes, would I find this offensive and allow you to take that consideration when determining uh, something constitutes unlawful harassment. Now, the, the second factor uh, of unlawful harassment uh, that we need to talk about is knowledge, and that is the employer's knowledge uh, of the uh, conduct. Um, and when you're looking at knowledge uh, of the employer, if the harasser is a supervisor, if the alleged harasser who's doing the uh, supposed harassment is a supervisor, that knowledge is imputed, meaning because you have given supervisors the authority to stand in the shoes of the employer, any type of act they take that constitutes harassment, the employer is immediately going to be on notice that um, it, it's occurring. And that's important because um, if that supervisor is doing something uh, unknown to his supervisors that constitutes harassment, it may not matter. It, as long as that supervisor has been given authority, for instance, to hire, fire, uh, do performance evaluations, um, those types of decisions, and they engage in harassment, it's automatic. Um, the employer's uh, on notice, and it's imputed to the employer that uh, they are aware of what's going on. Now, if the harasser is not a supervisor, um, it can be, the employer can get knowledge uh, either through actual, uh, meaning, let's, for instance, a supervisor is witnessing a coworker harassing another employer, 
or by implied knowledge, meaning that uh, it's been uh, reported by the employee and no, no action's been taken. So, and I want to talk about this knowledge um, requirement because this is where uh, your corrective um, actions become to play because one of the most important components uh, for you as an employer uh, to prevent harassment and to make certain that you are on notice and if any harassment occurs is to have and distribute a no harassment policy to your employees. Uh, the reason why this has been put in place, this requirement has been put in place, uh, is it puts the burden on employees to report harassment if they feel they're being harassed. And what this allows you to do is once you're on notice of this uh, alleged harassment, it gives you an opportunity to investigate it and um, if there is some type of wrongdoing occurring, the ability to correct it in the workplace. And so when you're looking at your uh, harassment policies, at the very least it should have a definition of what constitutes harassment. Uh, most employers provide examples in their harassment policies for employers uh, so they know what, what harassment looks like. Uh, also, you need to have a procedure for employees, how to pr uh, report the uh, harassment or alleged harassment, who do you report it to, and uh, also uh, penalties uh, for violating the harassment policy. So those are the three basics that you need to have at the very minimum in your uh, no harassment policy. And again, this is important because it provides a mechanism to put the employer on notice and give it knowledge that there's something going wrong that they need to look into. So let's talk about some of the, um, the issues that uh, might come up um, when you're, uh, you're dealing with employees who are bringing complaints uh, for uh, harassment. And, uh, and this is kind of from the employee's perspective first. Um, and you, the one case you might see is you get an employee who basically comes in and says, I, I want to talk to you about something, but you have to promise me not to tell anyone. What do you do when the employee comes in and brings to your attention that there is some alleged harassment going on, but they don't want you to share that information with them? Well, you, the first uh, rule of thumb is you cannot promise an employee to keep the information confidential. And the reason why is you have an independent duty outside of this employee to investigate uh, any type of alleged harassment in your workplace. Uh, that duty runs independent even if the employee says, I don't want anyone to know about this. Uh, you can still be held liable as an employer if you don't take action uh, based on any type of reporting of alleged harassment. And it also, you would have a duty to uh, remedy any type of actual harassment if it was occurring. What you can promise the employee is that you can keep the information on a need no basis. So that's probably the best response to this -ish situation when the employee comes to you and asks for confidentiality, confidentiality is to say we can't keep it strictly confidential but we will try to keep it on a need to no basis. The next scenario is the employee comes in there and says I want to tell you something about Joe but you have to promise he won't get in trouble. Again, an employee coming to you with a potential alleged harassment issue, but they don't want this person to get in trouble. Uh, maybe it's their supervisor, maybe it's a coworker. Uh, and again, just like with the confidential, you cannot promise the employee that no disciplinary action will be taken against this uh, individual. Uh, and again, this is because you as the employer, once you are on notice, of any potential harassment have to investigate it and if you find harassment is occurring you have to uh, take whatever means necessary to remedy the situation and that may include disciplining the employee uh, who is engaged in the harassment. Another situation, an employee saying, I don't want you um, to do anything, I can handle it myself. Uh, the classic bringing something to your attention, but I don't want you to do anything, I'm going to take care of it myself. And again, the problem here is once the employer is aware that there's a problem in the workplace, 
it's not the employee's responsibility to remedy the, the, uh, the harassment in the workplace. It's the employer's legal duty at that point to investigate and remedy it. And you cannot allow an employee to handle the situation by themselves. You have to conduct an independent investigation uh, of that harassment and take any remedial measures if you do find harassment is occurring. So let's look at some situations where uh, supervisors, some of their famous last words and situations you might encounter. First one, um, supervisor comes in and says, that's just the way he communicates. He doesn't mean anything by it. Um, and, and what's the problem with this situation where they're basically saying it's just the way the, the alleged harasser communicates. He's not really intending to do anything bad. Again, the, the, the test here is not whether the alleged harasser thinks the conduct of, is offensive. It's whether the, uh, uh, the alleged victim thinks it is offensive and unwelcome. So uh, you need to basically uh, bypass the situation uh, and say, no, we need to look at it and investigate and take whatever remedial me measures are necessary. The next situation, um, a situation where the employee says, let's see how it goes. If it doesn't get better by next month, let me know. And then you get a classic supervisor telling the employee to just kind of monitor the situation and, and let's give it some time. Um, the problem with this type of uh, handling a situation is that once the employer is on notice that there is something that could be going on wrong, meaning unlawful, unlawful harassment in the workplace, that's when your duty to investigate is triggered. It's not triggered a month later or two months later. It's at that time. And if you don't look into it, uh, it's at your own peril because if the uh, situation continues or and or gets worse, uh, you've basically got a, uh, a, a, a potential claim you could have remedied by investigating and taking potential action that has probably turned into a lawsuit at that time. And if you look at sexual harassment policy, it is the, the time for your policy to remedy a situation is before it turns into a lawsuit. Finally, a situation where a supervisor says it doesn't bother her. She thinks it's funny. Heck, the whole, uh, she's the worst in the whole bunch. And, and that's the classic, uh, she's not being harassed because she's telling jokes uh, just like everyone else. Uh, the problem here, again, is you don't know whether it's unwelcome until after you have talked to this uh, individual. And uh, under the reasonable standard person, it might be that the conduct has risen to a level where it does cross uh, that line. So let's look at the final um, situation when you have uh, issues of unlawful harassment. Uh, and that is uh, uh, you have to um, fail to correct any uh, harassment that may be occurring on the workplace. And that deals with correction. Um, for, I had already mentioned before, you should have a policy that's distributed to all employees. It's extremely important to make sure you have a record uh, of the employees uh, getting a copy of the policy, usually a signed acknowledgement that they have received and read the policy. As far as reporting, um, once a, a harassment claim has been reported and the employer is on, on notice about the issue, um, your duty to investigate uh, begins. Uh, the first thing you need to do is really find who or whom is going to investigate uh, into this uh, alleged harassment. And usually you want to pick someone who would be perceived or is uh, impartial and has knowledge of the harassment policies. Uh, I usually recommend it's someone of the same protected uh, characteristic as a victim. For instance, if the alleged victim is a female, you probably want uh, a woman uh, on the uh, investigation uh, that's African American, have someone, if possible, who's African American. Uh, and what do you have to do with that? First thing you need to do is interview the victim. The next, and, and what you want to get for that information is uh, what they saw, what they heard, who else uh, saw the, uh, the alleged harassment, and if possible, get that person to sign a statement uh, about what had occurred. The next is probably interview the alleged harasser 
to discuss with them the allegations of their viewpoint. Following that, uh, you would probably talk to any witnesses that the victim and or alleged harasser had identified. And at the very end of the investigation, it's really up to the investigator to make a credibility determination of who's telling the truth and whether some type of violation has occurred. So that's kind of the obligation and the steps needed to take to remedy the situation once a harassment claim is made. Now, an important point um, in dealing with any type of harassment or even discrimination claims is retaliation. Uh, all the laws, for the most part, federal laws and most state laws, uh, not only prohibit uh, harassment, but also prohibit retaliation for reporting uh, or participating in uh, an investigation of that. So um, it's very important when you're doing your investigation to uh, when you're speaking with a victim to make sure they understand that they believe after they've made this complaint when taking any type of retaliatory uh, action against them for them to report that like they would uh, the harassment. Uh, and it's also important to tell the uh, alleged harasser and any witnesses that no retaliation is permitted to anyone as a result of this bringing of the uh, complaint. And uh, as I, uh, I may have uh, uh, mentioned uh, before with the EEOC, um, where usually these um, these cases end up uh, if they're filed in federal court, uh, retaliation has become probably the, the most common type of charge filed with that agency. Uh, reason is, is um, more, more people are making these complaints in the workplace and if any kind of adverse action is taken against them as a result of making that complaint, they're going to be filing a retaliation claim pretty shortly thereafter. And they are probably the more difficult claims to uh, defend uh, if you're an employer because a lot of times in front of a jury, uh, juries sometimes have a hard time thinking of someone being a sexist or a racist, but they're not uh, as skeptical to believe that someone may have retaliated against or tried to get back at them and bring any complaint. And so retaliation claims can actually be more dangerous, I think, than other types uh, of discrimination or harassment claims. Uh, and, and the fact is, you can get the same amount of damages uh, for bringing a retaliation claim as for a claim for sexual harassment or racial harassment. Now, the need to know issue, uh, again, when you're doing your investigation, um, you have to be able to uh, talk to people, to interview people. And uh, there is one issue about telling people to keep information confidential. There's been a few cases out there, including the EEOC, that have uh, determined that employers can't necessarily tell employees to keep information confidential about this investigation. It's not very clear at this point um, where that law uh, line is being drawn, but some federal agencies have come out and said you really cannot tell employees uh, to keep information confidential. I still tell employers you should try to say, you know, this is on a need to know basis. This is obviously a very sensitive matter, so we really don't want you uh, having discussions uh, about that. And if you hear anything else, to, to bring it to our attention and, and keep it that way. Finally, as far as communication to employees uh, about uh, harassment policies, uh, I talked already about having a harassment policy and making sure it's distributed to employees. It's probably a good idea on, on an annual or biannual basis to redistribute that policy uh, by email or some other means of communication so everyone's aware of it. Um, more and more states are now requiring that you provide employees with training on uh, the harassment policies. This includes both training for employees as well as supervisors. So uh, it's important to you to look at your own state laws to see if those types of training uh, requirements uh, apply to you. All right, finally, just kind of a few uh, hypotheticals. And this is just to kind of get you thinking about various issues. Uh, first off, we have a situation where a male employee tells his female coworker about his great success with Match.com, encourages her to sign up so she can love life. So, uh, is that something that would be a form of harassment? Could that be actionable? 
Um, well, it's it's hard to say. I mean, uh, if at first blush looking at this, it seems like a very innocent comment, perhaps mentioned to a coworker. Maybe uh, he he is trying to uh, encourage her uh, based on his own success. But you know, you, you might have to look between the lines and see uh, first uh, first off, how many times this is occurring. Is this only a one-time occurrence, or was this a uh, is he is he continually going up and encouraging her to go on to this? Because, again, when we talked about whether conduct is severe or pervasive, if it's pervasive, if it's ongoing, it could rise to the level. Another issue is, is this on, oh, did the employee uh, tell him she's not interested or, or make it clear to him uh, that this is not something that she wants uh, to hear about? Um, and, and also, uh, another issue might be, is a male employee her supervisor, or is it just a coworker? If it's a supervisor, probably more of an issue uh, and a problem uh, uh, of him going and telling this female coworker about this, uh, getting on Match.com and making a coworker. Another situation uh, to look at is, you have an employee who has a physical disability, and coworkers make fun of this disability on a public block. Uh, and this employee brings a complaint to HR about what these employees were doing off duty. And, and the question becomes, does an employer have an obligation, since this happened off of uh, work and off work hours, uh, to do anything about it? And, and the answer is maybe. Uh, and the key is really, is this conduct that the coworkers are engaging in, this, you know, making fun of him on his the public blog, is it starting to impact this employee's ability to do his uh, his job, perform his work? Uh, because if it is, it's it's starting to reach the terms and conditions. And once it does that, then the employer has an obligation to investigate and essentially remedy any uh, any of this uh, type of behavior. So the answer to the question before, which I put up in the first slide, is even in some situations, off-duty conduct and trigger an employer's duty to investigate and take remedial measures to prevent the crash. Now, the, the final point. issue I, I want to talk about is uh, everybody's favorite. You know, I, I've got this name tag, hello, my name is your worst nightmare. Uh, this is the, the employee that, uh, that constantly complains about every issue. Everything that happens at work is some type of harassment, and they're constantly bringing uh, these issues to supervisors' attention or to resources' attention, saying, "I think I'm being harassed. I want you to do something about that." And and oftentimes you get this this situation where you've just had it with the employee, and I'm just going to, you know, you've looked at their their complaints before, and you tell them, "Just forget it. You've come with us with complaints in the past." Uh, they've had no merit, so just go oh, away. We don't want to hear you complain anymore. Um, there's a danger in doing that, um, and, and here's why. Obviously, yes, maybe there's been uh, complaints in the past that have turned out to have no merit, but if, in fact, uh, this employee has a, an issue, a legitimate issue uh, uh, or concern of a real harassment issue occurring at the workplace, and you tell them don't bring any more complaints to them, you've effectively eliminated your ability to, uh, to uh, uh, get knowledge of this harassment and take whatever remedial measures are necessary. Um, so what we usually encourage employers to do with these chronic complainers is to treat all their complaints seriously. Uh, some of the solutions you can have, uh, obviously, is try to educate the employee uh, about what constitutes harassment. Not every little workplace uh, issue is a, is a, is a, rises to the level of harassment, and uh, they need to have understanding it only applies to certain things. Uh, and also, maybe consider an alternate reporting mechanism to this employee. For instance, if they're, if they're starting to get on their supervisor's nerves to, to tell that employee to come directly to someone in human resources who might have better skills at coping with that employee and uh, dealing with these uh, chronic complaints. And um, so that's that's a couple of uh, ways to, to kind of work around it to try to educate the employee and create some alternate uh, reporting uh, mechanisms for them. 
the one thing that you have to watch out for is, uh, you know, I, I've seen some employers do it, firing or wanting to fire employees who constantly bring these uh, complaints. And you have to be very, very careful uh, on disciplining the chronic complainer, particularly right after uh, they're and making a complaint. Even the complaint turned out to have no merit, face a potential retaliation um, suit for them bringing the complaint because all that's necessary under law is that they had some good faith basis belief to bring that claim for harassment. They don't have to be right. They don't have to actually have been right that it was harassment. Just have a good faith basis. And if you take action against them uh, for uh, bringing uh, a complaint uh, with a good faith basis, you've just bought yourself a lawsuit for retaliation. So it's kind of a balance between you know, not, uh, not disciplining employees and, and having it construed as retaliation versus their disruptive behavior because chronic complainers can be disruptive. And uh, the, the, the workaround uh, uh, is this issue is to continue to educate the employee uh, and then tell them that you know, they need to basically um, limit um, these complaints that really have no merit based on the fact that it's starting to disrupt behavior. But you can't tell them they cannot need more complaints in the future. You just have to continue to counsel them on the nature of these complaints. So um, that's probably uh, all I have to say about that. Uh, if um, uh, I've been helped, I, I've enjoyed the uh, presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it too. Um, I know, Jill, you may have a few uh, parting comments to add to the audience. Yes, um, thank you so much, Scott. That was an excellent presentation. Um, there may have been a few audio problems um, for the attendees, and I'm hoping that when we uh, finalize the recording through GoToWebinar um, that the audio problem will be fixed. So we will send that link out when it's available. Uh, and for Scott's um, contact information, um, if you would like to contact us um, at 888-543-4778, or you can email us directly at info at firstacc.com. And Scott, I, I don't know if you have a slide um, of your contact information that we could put up. Uh, no, but uh, they can probably contact you if you, they need the information. Okay. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you very much and have a great day.